put my feet up today. Woke up at 3.30. I've been awake since 3.30. The change in times, that can be challenging, right? Whew. But, I don't know, what, two or three days or so, we should be back to normal, right? <clears throat> so, legs are up. I'm kicking back and I'm going to read some emails. How's that sound? This is titled, My Encounter at Canyon Creek. Hi, Steve. I'm not sure if you remember me or not, but I met you at the Lake Quinault Casino in Washington State on March 6, 2020. I met you and Dave Plytus there during a presentation you were putting on. You're an awesome stand-up guy. What are you doing after for being a safe place to come for people who want to share the stories? Right on, man. Good to hear. Thank you for the kind words. I'm 67 now, and all my encounters happened from the mid-70s through the mid-90s. It was during that period of time that I spent all my recreational time up in the mountains, mostly solo by myself like you do. I've seen these beings, only to find out that they are so... Yeah, I have seen these beings, only to find out that they are so elusive. They just vanish into thin air. One story I want to share is when I was miles off the road with just my shepherd in Canyon Creek above Chalachi Prairie. Now, I've run across a lot of black bear in the woods in my life, but this was no black bear. I didn't get to see it, and all I had for protection was an axe. But something big was moving slow in the forest, coming towards me. My dog Shiva was very protective and was growling and charging the noise, and then circling back to me and repeating that several times. I wanted to stay as curious as I was, but since I only had an axe, I turned around and ran back to where the car was parked. I definitely knew this wasn't a black bear because I've seen them in the woods before and they are silent and stealthy. This was different. This was big and big enough to move brush and it was coming at me like it didn't care to make all the noise. It was coming at me no matter what. And this was one of many encounters I've had. I also agree with you to get involved in your community and not be afraid to share your story. I do remember one time where I used to work at the Camas paper mill. I tried to share a story and was definitely a minority, but I never gave up and always said what I feel. There is proof that these beings do exist. Sorry if you like the email. Hopefully the punctuation is good. Keep up the good work. You're one of my heroes and I'm sure there are a lot of other people who feel the same way. Doug McKay, okay to share my name. All right, man. You're, uh, you are a free, brave man, Doug. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for speaking out loud about it. Uh, uh, it's frustrating when you see that we have been conditioned to shut up, <laughs> isn't it? It's very, very frustrating. So I love it when people email in and say, share my name. I'm like, you're damn straight, I'm going to share your name. You're a free human being. There's got to be more of us. We've got to make it. we got to make this, uh, make this way of life go viral, right? Everybody needs to be free and speak the truth. Now, what else do we got? It's funny, I wonder how many, uh, how many people are here. I wonder how many people that were at that thing in Quinault where Dave and I were. I wonder how many of you guys are still watching this channel. I'd imagine it'd be a handful of you anyways, I think. Now, oh, who's next? Weird experiences at Crane Lake, Ontario, Canada. Hey Steve, I guess it was about 30 years ago now. I would have been about 13 years old when four of my friends and I camped for a weekend at the lake my family cottage was on. We decided to camp at the most isolated spot from any other of the other cottages. The friends that were with me had very little to no experience camping or being in the woods at all. I, on the other hand, was very lucky when I was growing up. I spent every summer and most weekends at the cottage with the freedom to explore the forests and the lakes on my own for days at a time. We were all very excited to be there, but no one more than me because I couldn't wait to show them as much as I could. Well, 15 minutes after arriving to our camping spot, the sky instantly made everything around us dark with the weirdest black slash purple cloud filling the middle of the sky as it rolled toward us like a, like a wave in the ocean. There wasn't a cloud in the sky during the boat ride there, and there wasn't any bad weather in the forecast as we had been planning that weekend for quite a while. The dark cloud moved very fast, and in minutes we were engulfed in torrential rain and wind. It only lasted for about two minutes, and the sky was clear again. I'd never experienced weather like that before while at the lake and never since. 
I'm not sure this is relevant to what happened that weekend, but it always stuck with me as being very unusual for that area and wanted to share. The spot we were camping at was at the end of the long, narrow bay that got wider at the end. Next to our camping spot was the mouth of a shallow river that ran about a quarter of a kilometer into a small, isolated lake with no cottages. On the other side of the river, across from where we were camping, was a marshy area with a huge rocky embankment with lots of big trees. I remember being told as a child about an old abandoned boys camp that was on that isolated lake. When I asked why it was abandoned, I remember being told it had been overrun by rattlesnakes and to stay away from that area. <laughs> yeah, right. So anytime I camped there, I never experienced, I never explored too far in that direction. Interestingly, interestingly enough, when I got older, I researched this lake looking for more information about the boys camp and discovered there was never any boys camp there. At about 7 p.m. we were all sitting around the campfire when we were startled by a, a huge crashing noise that came across the mouth of the river from where we were camping. We all jumped up and with me in the lead we ran over to the edge of the river to see what had made the noise. To our surprise, Three healthy looking trees had fallen over, making an opening in the forested area on the embankment. Instantly, I noticed a large, dark, hairy figure peeking around a tree at the edge of the opening. At the time, I thought it was a bear and selfishly told my friends not to worry that the bear would not cross the river, lol, and they had nothing to worry about. I didn't want them to get scared and want to go back to the cottage. But to my amazement, no one else saw the hairy figure. So I convinced them to come back to the fire, hoping I could get them to relax and forget about what happened. As we walked back to the fire, I remember thinking it was unusual for a bear to push over healthy trees like that, and took one more look back as I followed my friends back to the fire. When I did, I saw two large hairy beings standing by the edge of the opening staring at us. I turned back and followed my friends to the fire, telling myself it was just two curious bears not to worry. As, as far as the detail of the faces, I couldn't make out too much other than they were both very large, with dark hair and clearly standing. We all quickly forgot about the incident and had a great night of laughing and bonding. Later on, when we were all in the tent after getting settled in our sleeping bags, our laughter was interrupted by splashing noises coming from the river. It was a huge splash and then quiet. About 30 seconds later, another huge splash. It sounded like big stones being thrown into the water. Again, not wanting to go back to the cottage early, I quickly tried to make the noise, the noises into something else and began telling everybody scary stories. Eventually, everybody forgot about the noises and fell asleep. I'm not sure what kept me up that night, but just before I was asleep, I heard something in the distance walking towards our tent. I would hear movement, and then it would stop. Each time, the noise would get closer and closer until whatever it was, was at the edge of the tent. For the first time in my life, I was nervous in the forest. I remember my heart pounding as I laid there as quiet as I could, hoping my friends wouldn't wake up and start making noise. All of a sudden, a very large human hand shape pushed into the top of our tent. Then it dragged, still pushing into the tent, along the top of the entire tent until it came back to where it started above my head. The tent went back to normal and it was very quiet the rest of the night. Whatever it was, I didn't hear it leave the area, which inevitably, inevitably kept me up for the rest of the night. I can't remember lying there trying to convince myself it wasn't anything to worry about, but I couldn't make myself forget what I saw or ignore the feeling I had in the pit of my stomach. I wasn't afraid of bears or anything else in the forest, but whatever it was scared the shit out of me that night. I'll never forget that feeling, and I've never felt that way since. The next morning, I, could, I couldn't see any signs of anyone or anything in our camp from that night. Nothing was touched or out of place, and there was no tracks of any kind. The rest of the weekend, nothing else unusual happened. I never told anybody about what I experienced that weekend until now. But it always stuck with me like it happened yesterday. It does with every single one of us. Every single one of us. That's the, we could all say that exact sentence without a doubt. 
As a child, I spent long stretches of time in the forest around that lake far away from people. I can remember the forest going completely silent at some point almost every time I was in the forest alone up there. I distinctly remember thinking it was weird to not be able to hear anything at all, but I always dismissed it because it was such a common thing for me to experience and nothing bad ever came of it. I'm still not fully convinced it isn't just something that happens naturally, but either way, I do listen and take it seriously when others say it's not a natural occurrence. It never happened to me as an adult, and I've never thought about it since I was a kid until I heard you talk about it. Thanks to you and everyone for sharing their experiences. Sincerely, Matthew. Okay, man. Welcome to the club. You know you're a member, and there's no way out of it. <laughs> And you know what you saw. It's amazing. I've had a whole pile of people email me about um, blocking stuff out that happened to them as a kid. But once I started listening to everybody here, then it brought it all back. And, uh, and now they want to get off their chest. Yeah, I've had a few people email me the same. We've even had some celebrities that we all know of email me the same thing, believe it or not. I want to keep their names hidden. That's fine. But it's a, it's a common thing. It's a common thing to, for people to remember the same, basically the same experience when they're a child. And uh, they remember it when hearing the stories being shared in this channel. And, it, and then it knee jerks them and want to write it and share it. So thanks for sharing it, man. I hope it helped a little bit anyway, right? You know what you saw. You know exactly what you saw. Crazy how many people managed to not say anything. Isn't that amazing? I'm trying to picture if I wouldn't say who I'm trying to picture myself in the scenario of who I might be with that I wouldn't say anything. I don't know. I, I understand it, I totally get it. I mean I know if I was I think possibly if I was in camp with a crew and we had hunters, which is a big dollar transaction, I probably wouldn't say anything to cook. So she wouldn't quit and take off until later. Yeah, I could see that happen. <laughs> Whatever. It's crazy. Man, I'm so tired right now. It's stupid, but this is about all I can do right now, I think. It's just keep reading. It's going to keep reading. My puzzle coming together. All right. Good news. Please do not use my name if you read this. Okay. I hope you didn't write it in here. My father is more than half Cherokee Indian. He grew up in the old ways of his people. When I was between the ages of 10 and 14 years old, we lived on 1,300 acres in Missouri. It was originally homesteaded by one of my dad's great uncles in the late 1800s. I had free run of the place and there was very little of that property that had not been on at least once. The house we lived in was situated in the middle of that place. There was a river that ran on three sides of the house. Behind the house, about 100 yards or so, was a large rock the size of a small house that sat on the edge of the river. The water was deep there and it made for a good, good swimming hole. One night my father and I went fishing off the big rock. We had been there about an hour or so when I heard what sounded like people talking way off in the distance across the bottomlands. I asked him if someone was coming to visit and he said it was, quote, talking owls, end quote. He gave me some kind of explanation about hoot owls during mating season will make a sound that sounds like someone talking. He said it could be kind of spooky if you didn't know what it was. In my young mind, it made sense and I accepted it as truth. A few minutes later, we went back to the house. I'm almost 65 now and my dad has been gone for close to 20 years, but if he was alive today, I would revisit that conversation with him to see if maybe he would have another explanation for those voices. I had become a member of the Club of No Return, though, and experienced one night while changing the batteries in a game camera a buddy and I had set up to watch for wild hogs. And that's another story as, and is outside the premise of this letter, so maybe I can share that one some other time. Oh! Should have included it. But since becoming a member of the club, my mind has brought things back to me. In my mind, I think it would be normal for someone who has experienced Sabe to obsess while looking for confirmation and answers. I did for several years. Memories of certain things, especially on the 1300 acres, have come together to give me an aha moment or two. My own little piece of the puzzle, if you will. Like for instance, in all my wandering around those woods, river bottoms and farmland, I always felt like I was being watched. Maybe I was being watched or maybe I was just a neurotic kid, who could say for sure. 
But also, I believe my dad knew what those voices were being Cherokee. I believe he made up some weird explanation so I wouldn't be afraid of the woods. My dad knew my constitution and knew that if he told me the truth, I would be afraid of the woods and would no longer explore the, the place. Perhaps that was commendable of him, who knows. Several years later, I get a summer job working with the Forest Service in Idaho. I was chased off the top of a mountain one night by something I couldn't see. It was just out of sight in the moonlight. At first I thought it could be a deer or something, and I wasn't afraid. But when I started back down toward camp, it followed me, and somehow that frightened me. I took off running down the side of the ravine where we were camped, and it followed me. Even as a stupid kid in my late teens, I knew the difference in the way a four-footed animal runs and a two-footed animal. I never saw it, but it kept pace with me on two feet. I never heard anything after that, it crunching through dry leaves, and I didn't smell anything either. Let me read that again. I never heard anything other than that it, other that it crunching through the dry leaves, and I didn't smell anything either. It's maybe ten feet from me, all the way. What? Ten feet? It was maybe ten feet from me, all the way down the mountain, till I got into the light of the camp. Oh, that would suck. That's not a nice thing to do to anybody. Whatever it was, it was gone at that point. I was happy to see a campfire and other people still awake. I told them what just happened. Nobody there seemed to have any idea what it could have been. I, don't, I didn't either at the time. Sasquatch, Sabbath, Bigfoot, or whatever, or whatever, it never entered my thinking until about 15 years ago when I joined the club while trying to find some wild hogs to shoot in Arkansas. But that's another story. That's a story you should have included. You better write back. All those experiences others have brought me to the point of being convinced that I have been around them many times in my life and was unaware of it. Several times I've been scared and others just calmly aware that it's being watched. If I had known then what I think I know now, I would have probably locked myself in my room and never come out. Thank you for your channel, Steve, and thank you for what you do. It's been the stories you read that have triggered memories of things I've forgotten, creating several ahas uh as I put my puzzle together. Keep up the good work. I apologize this was so, I apologize this was so long. Name withheld. Okay, man. Gotcha. Appreciate the, the uh, share. And uh, obviously, we want to hear your other stories, right? <laughs> get them in. Send them. Anybody else out there I think that would email me? You get it all in one email. I don't give a shit how long it is. I don't care how long it is. Get it all in there in one go, all right? And I appreciate you. appreciate you for spending that time to share with everybody through me. And I'm looking forward to hearing your story. Here comes another one titled Sasquatch and Dogman. Steve, I watched your channel since back when it was just hunting stories. I've listened to Sasquatch encounters for a couple years now. I've decided to share my two encounters. My name is Johnny, and you can use it when and if you read this. I was born in West Virginia, the tenth child of a coal miner. Just like everyone else in the coal mining community, we were poor and didn't have indoor plumbing for bathrooms. We had an outside toilet some 50 feet from our house. One night when I was eight years old, I and one of my brothers was going out to the outhouse. We never went alone in the dark. There's plenty of black bears and bobcats, so we went in pairs. Well, out there, we heard a horrible scream slash roar. It was so loud and long, it scared the bejesus out of us. We ran to the house. Nobody in the house heard it, but that would soon change. The year was 1960, and it was beginning to be fall. Nearly every night, we could hear this screaming and roaring in the mountains. It would last until spring, and we would not hear it again until the next fall. Dogs began to be found down on the creek, just mangled and dead. But no one was making any connection. A man who lived by the creek came out one morning at about 4 a.m. to go to work, and there was this very large thing standing on two feet in his backyard with his dog growling and barking. It was white. And he ran into his house, got his 22 rifle, and came out and shot it several times in the chest. He said it just turned and ran across the creek and up the side of the mountain. So from that point, it was just called the white thing. In late December 62, I and some friends was just leaving our, 
our sled riding place. We had a fairly good fire going, but there was a lot of snow and we stayed until it was pretty, pretty low and then we came off the hill. Then when we were about one to 200 feet away, we heard that scream slash roar and it was so close, we could feel the vibrations in our chest. We all turned back towards the fire and it was there, standing on two feet and solid white. It screamed again while we were looking straight at it. I think all the blood in my body ran out from the bottom of my feet. We all split up. Three ran to the left towards their house and my sister and I ran to the right towards our house. She kept saying, just keep running Johnny, Johnny Bill. Just keep running Johnny Bill. It wasn't chasing us, but we thought it was right on our heels. We got to our house, my dad was on the front porch and he said, did y'all hear that scream? We told him yes, what we had seen. And he said, okay, that's it. Y'all can't go back up there at night anymore. Then he said, as a matter of fact, none of y'all go at night. Just sit in the house till daylight. I can still hear that scream slash growl even today and I'm 69 years old now. I dream of it often but I've been an avid hunter all my life. Primarily, I think because at 16, I left home and moved away to the Southwest where I didn't think such things could be. I stayed in Texas for years and hunted Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Mississippi with no other encounters. Lucky man. Several times, I've had that hair standing up feeling with no encounter. Fast forward 2019, I, I now live in East Tennessee, about three blocks from Scott Carpenter. I've never met him, but I am on an avid, but I am an avid watcher of his channel and David Plotis. I saw a couple of the pictures that Scott has a dog man, but until 2019, I'd never seen such a thing. Again, it was late fall and a cold day, so I had my leather chaps and jacket on and was riding my Harley. I decided to ride the new section of the Foothills Parkway that had opened. It turns from Walland, Tennessee, through the mountains to Weirs Valley, Weirs Valley. It's about 25 miles, a beautiful ride. I made it to Ware's Valley and on up to Pigeon Forge to the Harley shop. I milled around a while and started back home. As I was riding back across the parkway, I was taking my time and just cruising slow and listening to my straight pipes. I came around a right-hand curve and there on the side of the road was a dog man standing. We come up the mountain from the Whalen side it was like everything went into slow motion. His head was huge, and his height was over seven feet tall. His tongue was hanging out, and his mouth was open, but he wasn't making a sound. His shoulders were wide, like nearly four feet. He was muscular and had many... What? He was muscular and had many arms with hands, but long fingers and nails. That might have been his typo there. And had... He probably meant and had long arms with hands. Whatever. Keep going. Sorry. Typo that for sure. So I don't think you meant he had many arms with hands, but long fingers and nails. He was definitely male. His legs were dog and his feet were dog. As I nearly got to him, he went down on all fours and lunged across the road in front of me. His back was still just above the windshield on my road king. His speed was absolutely blinding. He ripped across the road and down into a slight open area, but there were some trees. He never looked back. Even though it was all seemingly in slow motion, it could have been more than two minutes. Two minutes? Must have been two seconds. I was just in a shock at seeing such an animal. I do hunt here in Tennessee, but I am way more leery now than before. If I see one again, I'm and I am armed, I will not hesitate to put a 405 grain bullet in him from my Henry 4570. I've not told anyone of that encounter in person. I, s I sent it to a local channel, but after reading it, they just said they basically didn't believe in such a thing. Doesn't matter really because I was there, and so was Dog Band. And thank you, Steve, for this place to speak out. You're champion for truth, top notch human being, and a top notch human being, Johnny Bill. Okay, man, thank you for sending that, and I believe, I believe you, <laughs> right? Tennessee, you know what, I actually turkey hunt in Tennessee. First time I ever, the first time I ever went to the States ever was Tennessee. Was Tennessee. And uh, also the first place I ever hunted turkey. 
I definitely didn't know at the time that that steak was so choked up with these um, sightings. It's funny, the speed thing. Everybody who witnesses that speed, it's one of the first things they always say as well. It's how fast the, the speed of that thing scared the shit out of me. Most people, they, uh, most people mention, mention what stood out the most to them when they see something. That's one thing that I've noticed when I was talking to people in real, like when I was talking to people face to face, I noticed that the majority of the people that absolutely had a very credible experience, they always had an emphasis on the most, you know, bewildering part of their story, whether it be it was huge, you know, or it was so fast, it moved so fast. You know, they say, well, it's covered in hair, about eight feet tall, had big feet. They say, it moved so fast, man. It was so scary how fast it moved. As soon as they say that, you know they saw it, <laughs> right? You know they saw it. But anyway, she looks got up. You'd probably love to have a chat with you and swap some stories for sure, I'd imagine. Three, three blocks away, shit. All right, what else do we have here? Tennessee, I wonder why. I wonder why Tennessee has so many odd occurrences going on there. Excuse me. Hey Steve, CH again. Spring Bear is open here in Idaho still and went out to the other went out the other day. Got the courage up to go back to the spot where my dog was killed by one of these beings. My same friend that was with me then had come along with me and we both we were both nervous about going back into the area. We left the dogs home this time. We went up and parked in the same spot and started looking around the same looking around some, and after being there about 20 minutes, I started getting an uneasy feeling like something was watching us and didn't want us there. I tried what I've heard on your channel about the whole mind speak stuff. I told it I don't want any problems and that if you were the one that killed my dog, we were even as far as I was concerned and that I wasn't up there looking for revenge. It was like someone it was like someone flipped a switch. The easy feeling went away for me and my buddy as well. We never saw it or even heard it, but it was there. I can guarantee that. Still felt like we were being watched, but it didn't feel threatening. We spent about three hours up there glassing for bear and keeping a lookout just in case for an upset Sasquatch, but never saw one, and the uneasy feeling never came back. My buddy and I sat there and spoke about what happened with my dog and us doing what we did and I wouldn't change a thing. I'm like you, Steve, I don't want problems with Sasquatch, dog man, little people, or regular everyday people for that matter. I want to be left alone to enjoy what I do. I like the solitude, but I also like hunting with a good friend that shares the same values as I. These beings leave me alone, I'll leave them alone. They want to fight, I'll fight. I have a question for you, Steve. How do we live with this knowledge that they exist, and how do we tell our children? I can't care less about what people think of me or say about me, but I worry about my kid and my wife, because I know how cruel people can be to another human being. P.S. After you read my first story, the next day I got a phone call from a restricted number saying that they were from Fish and Game asking questions about where I hunt and fish. I thought it was a little strange. Fishing game never called before now, so I hung up without answering any questions, and they haven't called back since. And that's the end of the email. And that sounds pretty creepy to me, right? How'd they even know to phone you? How'd they even know it was you? And what's and you? I'm, I don't remember. I think I have a feeling. Are you the guy that email said that it was killing the dog in the box of the truck? That's one email that stands out right away. I wonder if that was it. Somebody phoned you and asked you where you hunted and fished. You should have said, come on out and I'll take you and show you, right? I've been thinking about that. I, I, I mentioned that before. It wouldn't be hard, would it? It would not be hard at all to someone, whether Canada or US, wherever. It would be quite easy to lure one of those pricks out into the open, meaning the human beings that potentially, maybe if they are, the guys in the black SUVs, whatever you want to call the douchebags, if they, it would be easy to draw them out. All you'd have to do is get a handful of people in your community 
we're on the same page, to phone in in a big panic. Everybody got a vaguely the same description, roughly the same area, and dropped that, that this just went down just now, blah, 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 two or three of them, on and on and on, make, make up a, a very delicious story that would entice them, and then get ready for them to show up, and then take big pictures of them and send them to me so I could share them all over the freaking planet, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Maybe one day if I got some spare time and I'm feeling a little, a little cheeky, I'll do it. I'd love to do that. Humans are easy. Humans are so easy to, to hunt. Especially those egomaniacs, it'd be pretty easy to draw them out, wouldn't it? All you gotta do is go to a, make sure it was a well-known area, get a few different people, spread it over miles to panic, to panic report the same thing to either the state troopers or the RCMP. And then just start waiting. You just laid the bait down and just wait, wait for them to come. No matter who it was that came, take pictures, clear their face, set up a trail camera on video that they can't see, do whatever you got to do, and expose their asses. But anyway, not that they count that much, right? Not that they count at all. Moving along. All right, let's get somebody else heard before I start going on a big ramble. Ramble, bamble. A Southwest Virginia encounter. Hello, Steve, and the rest of the community. Been a fan of this channel after stumbling upon a while back. Just wanted to share an encounter I had down in Southwest Virginia back in the mid-90s when I was a student at Virginia Tech. One Friday after a long weekend of classes, me and one of my roommates, who also was a childhood friend, <clears throat> excuse me, decided to take an overnight camping trip. Nothing out of the ordinary since we would frequently go caving, fishing, and hiking. We each grabbed our tents, food, and other crap, tossed in his car, and hit the road. My friend said he knew a place that was off the beaten path, and he wasn't kidding. It was pretty late at night by the time we got there. This place was several miles deep in the park and looked like nobody had been there in a long time. We parked the car in a decent-sized clearing and quickly gathered up some wood started a small fire. We pulled out our small tents to set them up and then opened up some food like granola bars and chips, etc. We decided to get more wood because the small fire we had going wouldn't last too long. We saw a rather large brush pile the other side of the clearing, so we figured there should be plenty of wood in it to use. We walked over to it and began pulling tree branches from the opposite sides of the pile. We were taking our time, mostly because it was pretty damn dark, except for our fire, and we were also just shooting the shit and joking around. After a few minutes of pulling out old broken branches and such from the pile, our talking seemed to simultaneously slow down and eventually stop. Me and my friend seemed to notice it at the same time. In the darkness, not far from the brush pile and campsite, was a pair of glowing eyes. These eyes were orangish red, kind of like when you take a picture of a person the flash on, and maybe about four feet from the ground. We froze in place, wondering what we were seeing. It was a few moments later when this creature seemed to be startled and maybe aware that we had seen it, it then quickly and quietly stood up because those glowing eyes were no longer four feet off the ground but easily nearly twice that height much taller than either of us so there we were frozen in place looking at a pair of orangish red eyes that were now looking down at us after what seemed like an eternity but probably only 10 20 seconds it purposely exhaled loudly this creature must have been massive because the amount of volume in those lungs was incredible. It then started to make some kind of growl slash gurr sound from deep within its chest, so deep and powerful that you could practically feel it. Pattern number three, feeling in your body, right? That was enough for both of us and we dropped the wood and bolted out of there. We didn't bother grabbing our camping gear, open food or anything. We just jumped in my friend's car and got the hell out of Dodge. We came back the next day to grab our gear and maybe try and figure out some questions about what the hell happened the previous night. The campsite was how we left it. Tents and everything were untouched, including the open bags of chips and granola bars. We went over to the brush pile and the location where the glowing eyes were, and there was a tree, and immediately behind it was the tree line. This creature must have been beside or partially behind the tree. The distance from the brush pile of the tree was 20 to 25 feet. We took turns walking over the tree 
and making completely unscientific estimates on the height. We both came to the conclusion seven feet was the minimum. Very likely taller, but impossible to be sure. To this day, my friend says it was a bear. I won't discuss it anymore. When I recently asked if you remember where this happened, he texted me a link from Google Maps in less than five seconds. I think he feels it wasn't a bear, and it has bothered him enough to bookmark the location after all these years. The thing that has always stuck with me was not so much the glowing orange-red eyes, it was the behavior of this creature. The start reaction it had when it realized it had been spotted after we slowly stopped talking, then acted like it was pissed at us or something. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to share my story. I'm not a hunter, so I can't say whether it was a black bear or not. The logical answer is black bear. But after 25 years, I'm still thinking it could have been a Bigfoot. I'd like to hear you and the community's opinion on it all. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff, you know exactly what I'm going to say if you've been here a while, right? You know what it was. You already know what it was. You knew what it was before you emailed me. Nothing... Black bear's eyes don't glow orange red in the dark, and they don't go from four feet off the ground to double that size. It just doesn't happen. You know what it was. <clears throat> maybe when, if you're still in touch with your buddy, you might want to maybe pass him this video, just so that he knows to uh, he he can he can build his confidence up a little more, so he knows that he's not alone, and uh, that it's safe. And it's actually quite normal now to have this shit go down in the middle of nowhere, unfortunately. Hmm. You know, it's funny you mentioned the dogs. That first time I took my dog down to the river, excuse me, on the quad, was the first time I realized, oh shit. I was worried for, I'm worried for the dog. I mean, you know, I was thinking, I'm, am I going to take her steelhead fishing with me into that, you know, kind of re the remote area of the island? But there's a lot of sightings around there. I'm like, shit, man. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to have her getting ripped apart. That would kind of suck. Wolves too. Wolves are a concern. Wolves do not tolerate <coughs> canines. It's kind of weird. I got somebody got to worry about when I go in the middle of nowhere by myself when really I, th I was thinking it would be good to have this protective dog around the property, right? Now I'm worried about it. <laughs> How am I going to protect it? But anyway, nice big bright orange collar and keep her with me anyway. A couple of spots I can't bring her because I have to go across like chest deep across the river. And I couldn't see uh, being able to pull that off with her. But anyway. Anyway, anyway, that's about all I got. I gotta crawl underneath my truck, throw a new starter in the damn thing right now. Get that done. And start thinking about doing other things around here. But I'm so tired right now. It's kind of frustrating because I'm I'm not a uh, I'm not a day napper, and uh, it's a nice sunny day out, and I can't stand wasting time. But I am freaking messed up from from my sleep being off. I think what time is it right now? I don't know what time is it. It's uh, 20 after 10 a.m. So that means it is around midnight, 1 a.m. my time right now. It feels like it too. But anyway, getting back to what we were talking about the other day about sharing stuff and learning things. I don't know how to do it. How do I share what I know with people without just sounding like a, a ranting maniac when it is, it's absolute truth that I need to share. You all need to know these truths if you don't already. And uh, if you prefer to look away, I don't know what I can do for you. Not much. Looking away is one of the things that's got everybody where we are now. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what, where to start sharing what I've learned. Do I go from the beginning and tiptoe forward to take everybody along the journey with me? It'd be, it'd be a little too much just to throw it down, the summary, and one big blast, you know what I mean? One thing I will share with absolute confidence is right now, currently, um, possibly the, the number one enemy of all of us on the planet today, with absolute confidence, is uh, I've narrowed it down to two countries, although my country is absolutely corrupt and involved as well. But the main, I'm trying to get to the bottom 
the main source, the main motivators. And it is either going to be the United Kingdom or the US, one or the other. But we are 100% under the thumb of the absolute enemy right now. Unfortunately, I know it's a little vague. I know there's no conspiracy bullshit. That word can go ram it somewhere. There's some very, very serious, nasty, disgusting items going on right now that are affecting every single one of us, no, no matter what, how much you want to look the other way. There's no way of getting out of this one. I think one thing, maybe just for right now, I would love to possibly, hopefully, encourage everyone to absolutely ignore mainstream news. That is absolutely vital. That is the number one tool used against every one of us. And without it, the evil bastards are nothing. The children, you need to speak openly and honestly with the children. You need to point out to them the truths about absolutely everything you can. If you really seriously want hope for the future of this whole frickin' ball of wax, you need to be honest with the children about every one, all the players, what they've done, what's going on, what's been done, what we're not allowed to talk about. You need to be honest with the children and, and deprogram them if they haven't been programmed already and teach them honest knowledge. It's very, very vital and very important right now. And I know there's gonna be a handful of people humming and hawing and groaning right now, but too bad, just leave them. It's easy to skip over this part. But um, it is very, 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 very important, very vital that we kick the mainstream news aside. You have to. Any topics they are bringing up and trying to push on you right now, you need to ignore. It's just bullshit and made to distract you. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden there's UFOs getting shot down out of the sky. And I can't, even, I can't believe I just repeated that right here. It's embarrassing for me to repeat the bullshit they come up with. But yeah, I've got a lot to share. I've got a lot. I haven't even shared anything, have I? But I do have some important things I need to get across to, the, to everybody. I have to, because if I don't, I'm an idiot. I'm a pussy and uh, I'm helping the bad guys. So, look into it. I can guarantee you we are living under the thumb of the absolute enemies of the world today and the main culprit is either in the United Kingdom or United States right now and I would bet my life on it right now. I guess I'm being a little vague, aren't I? I think I'm too tired right now to give a, a good decent delivery of what I've learned and what I know and I got receipts. All right, I got all the receipts. The receipts are out there, everything's out there. But where to start? Just I've learned so much alarming things this past little while. <clears throat> and uh, I can eat a little bit of sleep, catch up my sleep, and then I'm gonna deliver what I know in a very palatable fashion, <laughs> right? So it doesn't sound like some lunatic going on some kind of a ranting tirade. It's just fact. It's not my fault, it's fact. I didn't, I didn't make it up, I didn't come up with it. It's been slapped in my face and many others' faces, and there's a lot of people trying to share it. And it's amazing how, it's just amazing to me. Like I said, in the very, in the very first video I made on this topic, when I came forward, public said, okay, yeah, I've seen the damn things. And I remember, I'm pretty sure it was that video, it wasn't the first one, it was the second one, where I said flat out, I'm more amazed at watching human beings than I am at the fact of these things, these other people running around the forest. And I meant it, and I still mean it today. It's amazing the, the items that displays the facts, the honest truths, how they are slapped in every one of your faces and mine every single day. And it's amazing to me how we all react. We don't. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? It's absolutely mind boggling. There's some very, very, dark, evil sons of bitches who are set, basically borderline sabotaging our existence. All of our lives have been spiraling. Every, anybody who lives in the West, especially, our lives have been spiraling in quality. There's no way denying that. And it is only because of some individuals. So, 
anyway, I'm so tired right now. I'm gonna, I better stop right there so I can tell I'm just gonna start babbling, but you need to, uh, all you people who prefer to look away, you better stop it. You better think twice about that. And all you people who know what I'm talking about, email me, tell me how you, do, how you, would you deliver it. You know what I mean? How would you deliver it? Anyway, I'm gonna to try to make a difference as much as I can. I just gotta, I gotta do it right. I gotta do it right so my time is effective. And then at least, you know, in the end, at the end, one of my last days, at least I can sit there and, and know that I did the right thing. All right, I did it. I was honest, I shared, I, I shared everything I learned with everybody. I did it, I didn't keep a secret. I didn't keep my mouth shut and I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. And I didn't stay silent to help the bad guys, right? Anyway, probably not even making any damn sense, as usual, but email me again, email me more, share my story at howtohunt.com with these experiences and I'll get that, I'll get that information out, all right, so everybody can sponge off of you and become better, up to speed with true knowledge and pass it on to the children. In the meantime, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to share with you everything that I know in a nice, smooth, short and condensed version so that I, I still retain your attention and then you can fully absorb what I've got to share and you can do with it what you will or leave it. But at least I did my part and I shared the truth, right? There you go. I'll be back shortly.